Welcome to the Two Essential Paradigms for Successful Horse Training webinar with Mary Wanless and Heather Blitz. Mary Wanless is an internationally renowned coach and is the author of the Ride With Your Mind books and DVDs. She coaches riders at all levels from relative novices to two of the top 12 US dressage riders and some of the Canadian eventing squad. She has Bachelor of Science degrees in both physics and applied sports coaching and holds the BHSI certificate. Heather Blitz is an international Grand Prix rider, Olympic team reserve and Pan Am gold medalist and is head trainer at Cutler Farm Dressage. Somebody in South Africa who must be staying up really, really late and I'm sure a few folks in the UK as well as folks here in America. So hi to everybody from me. And hi to everybody from me, Heather Blitz. I'm happy to be here on the webinar and I'm excited to share some information with you about how we get our horses to go in amazing ways and hope we can um, add to your experience riding your horses. So we called this about two um, paradigms that are necessary for training to be successful and I'm hoping you can see my screen here where it talks about there's another catch-22 in learning and the catch-22 that I think underlies the whole drama of learning to ride well and train horses well is that until the horse goes right, the rider cannot sit right, and until the rider sits right, the horse can't go right. And we have ways of trying to eat into this, me from my end of the spectrum, which is rider biomechanics, and really that until the rider sits right, the horse can't go right. And Heather's take on horse training, which is phenomenally successful and effective, and essentially has been built on those really good biomechanics. But if you start with that catch-22, I think that many people fall into the trap of either they think about the horse and not them, or they think about themselves and not the horse. So the folks thinking about themselves and not the horse might be the minority. They will be people out there practicing their position, working really hard, but not taking that so much into the sphere of influence and I confess it drives me nuts when people say that Murray won this coach's seat and position because it's so much more than that. My aim is to coach how the rider organizes herself in order to have influence on the horse. And then maybe more the majority of riders are there going, I'm training their horse and they're doing whatever they're doing to their horse, mostly in total ignorance of what they are doing themselves in that process. And neither of those really deal with what we might talk about as interface, the interface of how the rider contacts the horse. So I'm going to change my slide here, which I hope you can see. So, you know, if we address this from the side of making the horse go right, a lot of people's idea might be put, it, put another gadget on ride the horse yourself or having ridden by a more skilled and experienced rider who can set him up for his own rider and that undoubtedly has value but at the end of the day it doesn't always increase skills. Put the horse in training with a more skilled and experienced rider that can be valuable. Use groundwork to make him more rideable that can be valuable too but without the experience of the rider really learning about interface we're kind of in trouble. So on interface, you're really trying to unpack what do you do to the horse and what does the horse do to you? So how do you organize him and how does he disorganize you? So I think Heather's take on training is built at least partly, if not pretty largely, on being such an organized rider that she can really organize the horse underneath her. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's totally true. I have a really basic system of training horses uh, that only works because I have a very well set up framework in my body and I'm aware of it because of the work from what I've learned from you and your biomechanics. So uh, the simpleness that I can approach my training or, or my student training horses uh, has to have the biomechanics and bodies, uh, riders' body awareness in place or it would be not successful at all. Yes. So, so let's take this as an example. Um, a walk halt transition. Many people will lean back to ride a halt, and many people get taught that that's the right thing to do. 
And in that lean back to halt, they get into what I would think of as water ski position. And as they lean back, the laws of physics encourage the horse to do what I would call motorboating out from underneath them. So it's rather like if you were on a rug and the rug was on a polished floor and somebody pulled the rug out from under your feet, the more you leant back, the faster would go out, the rug would go out from under your feet. So that would be the same too as if you were a rather novice skier there on your skis thinking, I really don't want to go down this mountain and leaning back, your skis will go out faster underneath you. That's the laws of physics. So those laws of physics really dictate that if you're going to ride walk to halt, you have to stay vertical because the fact that you're leaning back will send the horse against your hand, being the motorboat, who tows you along horse gear. So if you were to try and break that rule and lean back, you would have, if you understood how this worked, to totally expect the horse to stop well. But most people would expect that. So that's an example of until the rider sits right, the horse can't go right. And we are hoping that we can train the rider to go, ooh, that was a good transition, I stayed upright, ooh, that wasn't so, so good, I leant back more. And that the rider can begin to figure out the got it, lost it, got it, lost it that's going on there. Another example would be what we might call the noise to signal ratio in a rider sitting. So riders who've been taught to be supple and go with the movement will tend to be jiggling their butt about in the saddle, maybe just in walk, with big seat bone movements. And I would say that nine times out of ten, that is overkill. And what's happening is that the horse is experiencing a whole load of noise, moving butts, moving legs, moving hands. And how the heck is the horse supposed to know what is just noise and what is a meaningful signal? And I have something to add to that too, because how is the rider supposed to realize whether or not the horse was very responsive to the aid that they used? Because an aid to make your horse go, for instance, from halt to trot should be something as simple as the lightest touch of a lower leg. And if the rider has all the static going on, you know, can they tell there was a split second decision that the horse said yes, or was there a delay and there was a, an agreement that he made? And did the rider have to work harder so the rider can also not really tell if the horse was very reactive and responsive if, there, if they've got a lot of noise going on? Yeah, sometimes I think about that a bit like, let's suppose one of your so-called friends, you invite her around for a cup of coffee, she sits down in your kitchen and she goes <laughs> for the next two hours. And when she leaves, she thinks you had a great conversation and you're there sitting, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. I never got a word in edgeways. She bombarded me. And it's at that point not a two-way conversation because that person was never quiet and still enough to listen for the response and to notice that response when it happened. So being able to uh, observe the rules of physics, as in water ski motorboat as an example, and to be able to really keep very low noise to clear signals would be a really big part of until the rider sits right, the horse can't go right. So somewhere here I have a slide that says, if we address our catch-22 from the side of making the rider sit right, we have to address her riding skills, i.e. her biomechanics, also teaching her how to feel and what to feel for. We have to provide her with experience in her stress zone or learning zone. So not in her comfort zone where it's just too easy and not in her panic zone because at that point in time she's not learning, she's just reacting. And we have to set realistic goals so we're helping that rider home in on them going you're hotter, you're colder, you're hotter, you're colder, you're hotter, you're colder. And we endeavor to set up our interaction with that rider to do what I call giving her a taste of strawberry jam, somehow giving her a sense of rightness so we can say, this is the feeling we want you to home in on. This is the way of organizing your body that can work with the horse. This is the way that is not water ski motorboat. This is much less noise and a much clearer signal. And if we can do that, we can get somebody in a mode where riding to train the horse well is more possible. 
And then the concept of the strawberry jam, it's a, it's a good one because nobody would know what that is. You couldn't just tell them to, uh, to know what it is until they have a piece of it. So, I mean, Mary's talking about giving a um, feedback to moments when uh, the right words make the right physical response in the horse and, and the rider's body so they can have a taste of it before, uh, so, so they can know what those words mean. Yeah, so we're always trying to link the words we use in feeling to, or in teaching, to a certain feel in the rider's body and try to get them very precisely homing in on a feel with a minimal amount of slippage. So one of my bugbears is what I call fuzzy language within riding. So things like sit deep and use your back and driving forward could be interpreted in a huge number of ways. And we're always trying to be really precise in getting the rider to take on a certain pattern in her body, which is pattern that can pattern the horse underneath her in the way we want. So do you want to talk more about reactivity training? Well, if a, if a rider is coming at um, at this point with a form of body awareness and control, and they've got a good framework, they don't do things like lean back when they are telling the horse to stop or slot and be really noisy and making a big effort with their body uh, to make the horse go, then I could um, make the claim that I think your training can be as simple as if you close your hand, that should tell the horse to stop. If you add a tiny bit of something just from your lower leg with nothing else happening from the knee up in your body, that should make the horse go. So there can be a lot of complex um, words and theories around in a lot of uh, situations. Riders are told to get more impulsion or have the horse get more throughness or make more collection, um, make them rounder. And I think those are really complex works when I think it boils down to a matter of if you get your horse to be reactive between a really simple obedience to go and really simple obedience to stop, um, then the horse should come up with all of those complex the theories um, as a result of being in a very good state of uh, athletic just readiness. So um, you know, if there's a lot of clarity in the rider, there's not a lot of noise, and the rider can put um, uh, just a normal leg a very light. Um, horses can feel, of course, very sensitive things like a fly landing on their side. So, you know, a leg aid shouldn't be something that takes a lot of muscle or hamstring to to use. And the horse's appropriate response should be um, within an instant, not after they thought about it for a while or they any sort of delay, but should be in an instant, just a very pleasant yes ma'am or yes sir um, sort of reaction. And uh, the same with a direction to come back. It, I mean, to me, if a horse is sensitive and obedient enough, you close your hand into a little bit more of a fist around the rein um, without shoving and pushing and leaning and squeezing and many complex things. And I think the horse then, um, in a very obedient way, should cover less ground and then remain in that balance even when it's opened again. I mean, those are two really basic concepts, but in most cases I find that um, riders cannot operate in such simpleness because they don't have the framework set up in their body to, um, to keep it that simple. Most riders' bodies are adding in way more information in an effort to make that horse do what they've been told it should do. Um, I definitely want my horses to go, and I definitely want my horses to stop, but as far as the complex theories, like what impulsion is, what collection is, what throughness is, those are very complex theories and humans that try to create those things for the horse end up being very complicated and missing out I think on just the basic obedience of go stop and then of course left and right that didn't go into detail but also in very simple ways um, just keeping the horse saying yes um, with a smile on his face. <laughs> Um, really simple aids can go a super long way, but I've also had two decades of really focusing on my body and um, the mechanics that I use um, to stay very still and a very good sensor as far as what my horse is doing underneath me so that my aids can be that simple. And I think another part of that is that Heather has very clear boundaries. She absolutely defines what should be her job and what should be the horse's job. And I imagine she might talk later about the danger of the rider filling in for the horse. But very few of the riders I see 
really have that stricter boundary. So maybe the horse kind of goes, and the next time they do a stronger leg aid, and the horse kind of goes, and the next time they do a stronger leg aid and a sharp. And mm. and I guess the ultimate would be the rider who, in reality, if we dug deep and really got to the truth, would be scared of having her horse go with power. And that rider is actually underneath it all, rather happy to just sit there and kick and kick and kick and kick and kick and kick and have the horse not go. And I've even had instances where that rider has said to me, but I'm trying, <laughs> like that should earn her a lot of brownie points. But at the same time, she's actually ensuring that she won't succeed, mm. right? Yeah. And it is undoubtedly the easiest thing in the world to train your horse to be dead to the leg. And a very tricky thing to have the physical, mental, emotional boundary that especially on the go aid says, no horse, I said go. Yeah. And I'm not going to wiggle and jiggle and shove and beg and nag to make go. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important at that point to realize the difference between an aid and something that reinforces the behavior. So if the behavior is not correct, um, I would not suggest just making a stronger aid and then have the horse say, oh, sorry, I should have listened. And then they make the forward response and then the rider often pets the horse for that. And um, I think that's giving pretty mixed uh, signals because at first you wanted the horse to respond to a light aid, ideally, and then if a stronger aid comes into play, and then that made the horse go, but almost made them, you know, angry about it or panic or whatever, and then they get praised for that, and there's a real problem um, in that case because you're sort of teaching the horse to wait for the second round of leg or the third round or the fourth round or the seat or, and then all of the other things. And then as soon as the horse goes, they might, the rider might say, good, 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 that's great, because you're moving forward. But what you're teaching them then is that's how hard you're going to work to make that happen. So I think that you need to define whether you're going to use an aid. And, of course, if your horse is very happily moving away from an aid, the, uh, you know, praising the horse um, quite a lot is very appropriate and teaches them exactly what you want them to learn. But when she, if your instinct, and it's a strong instinct, is to um, have your horse, if it doesn't go uh, really promptly, then come with a stronger aid and then the horse goes. The instinct is really to pet the horse then. The, the, if, you, if you have to make a reaction because the horse didn't respond, that needs to be a different category and it should not be treated as an aid. That should be something that really alerts the horse to there are consequences for them not paying more attention. So that doesn't necessarily have to make the horse happy and with a smile on his face. That might make the horse a little bit thinking, uh-oh, I don't want that to happen again. I'm going to listen next time. And then the whole the routine should be repeated. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a big one because I think a lot of people would do an aid, do a consequence, which was actually just a stronger aid, right. and then the horse canter around the arena three times. Yeah. And they might say, good, good, good horse, but the horse went around the arena from more of the consequence. Yes. Rather than from the aid. So there's a big difference there. So you would say you do a light aid. When the horse doesn't listen, there's a consequence, and it's a tap tap with your leg and your stick. It, it could be it depends on the sensitivity of the horse. You, the, the consequence needs, needs to promote in the horse a I don't want that to happen again. It, it just needs it, it's not comfort zone. It might be at the edge of stretch zone, and every horse is different. So I can't say exactly what the consequence is. Just the rider has to know in their mind that it's not an aid. Yes. You don't want to reinforce with a stronger aid. It needs to be either an aid or consequence. Consequence just needs to get a different reaction out of the horse. And that's what you said. Some riders might be a little fearful of that because that's actually going to change the horse's uh, mindset from being sort of in a comfort zone like, oh, it's the rider I've known forever and it's her. I know what to expect into something more like kind of yikes. So I want yes. that to happen again. And that moment might be frightening for some riders who just do the same thing over and over and it gets nagging. So at the point of having to really make a change in the horse's personality, that's what the consequence needs to do. And then it's really necessary to come back and repeat the moment again so you get the horse a chance to try listening to the light aid again. And to get it right. And to get it right. Or if necessary, experience the consequence again. Yeah. And I, and I have seen many, horse after horse after horse, that ride and say, oh, he's lazy, he doesn't really, he's not that forward, he's not a he's not forward-thinking horse. I have seen many horses like that maybe take a couple of times getting more of a consequence, 
and really change something and then turn into for the rest of the ride being quite sensitive and a rider maybe they need to say it's enough now we <laughs> maybe we work on slowing down. Yeah. So it can really change horses even if you think you have a lazy one. Sometimes I explain it to riders who whose tendency is to nag the horse that it's almost like they're having a conversation with the horse where they're saying to him you've got to get out of bed and the horse goes I don't want to and they go you've got to I don't want to blah 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 and we all know that being in bed in the morning thinking oh I've got to get out of bed I don't want to I've got to is the worst part of it once you get out of bed to start your day mm -hmm. life gets a whole lot better mm -hmm. yeah so rather than the Got to get out of bed. Don't want to. You've got to. Don't want to. Ba da ba da ba da ba da. There's a level of rip bed clothes off him. <laughs> get him out of bed. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not doing anything punishing. It's kind of light and quick. And hey, you. Yeah. And I think horses are much happier being in that state of mind than just yes. going around like girls around the arena and being nagged and nagged and nagged. A couple of consequences that sharpen up and enlighten the horse, and then they go around being a partner. Are much happier and they're they're happy for the challenge than the ones that are getting kicked and kicked and kicked and it doesn't mean anything. It's like sitting in the kitchen with a friend going blah 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 yes. for an hour and you end up tuning out because it's so boring. Nothing nothing makes any difference. Yes, or it's like going into a restaurant or a supermarket and there's background music and you don't hear it any yeah. longer. The horse yeah. just tunes it out because it's so repetitive and so predictable. And actually, in the consequence and the bedclothes off him you're actually changing his brain chemistry. Yeah. You know, he needs more get up and go brain chemicals at that point. And the chances are that the rider also needs more get up and go brain chemicals because she's a bit ba -da, ba -da, yeah. ba -da, ba -da. But that's very different than just getting your horse more forward. Most riders are going to just take their horse and make the tempo faster or just try to go faster forward because they're told that forward is going to fix everything. But it is a, it's a, it's a mental a brain chemistry, like you said, much yes. more so than can you just make the tempo or the miles per hour faster. Yes. And then the other thing with that go aid, if you did a consequence, would be doing your best to stay with it. If the horse trotted or cantered out from underneath you, your aim is to be vertical, be in place, be bearing down, be as organized as you can possibly be. And you might lose it a bit because it, it could be quite a celebration. But you're giving it your best shot to stay really organized. And if you were Heather Blitz, you would undoubtedly stay pretty <laughs> every highly organized. Time, every time. <laughs> Never ever lose it. <laughs> Just in the same way, in a down transition, you're doing your best to not water ski, to be on the balance point, to stay organized. Yeah, so that's about the go aid. So that's about the yeah. go aid. And I think um, the other thing we could say, if it came to a half halt, you know, the most misunderstood thing in riding probably and something that I don't think we can sit here in any sensible way and tell you how to do but we can tell you that in a really good half halt the rider does not break the rules of biomechanics and breaking the rules would be leaning back so you set up a water ski motorboat situation where actually you wanted more collection um, breaking the rules will be pressing more in your stirrups, breaking the rules would be growing tall and lifting your chest, breaking the rules would be sucking your stomach in, breaking the rules would be a pull on the rein rather than the closing of your hand. You're shoving on the horse's back would be breaking the rules. So, you know, we could talk more easily about what the rider doesn't do in a half halt and what makes it complicated and a load of noise and a load of incongruent communication to the horse. We can talk about that more easily than we can talk about what it is that the rider really does do that makes it work. Mm. But we can say that she stays on the balance point, she stays bearing down, she stays vertical, she stays organized. There's this little close of her hand. And because her body's in place, she's saying something that, by the laws of physics and in the language horse, makes sense. Mm. I think it's important at this point, too, talking about half halts, and it is such a, a tiny little phrase that can be interpreted in tens of thousands of ways is to um, is to talk about how so many riders I think uh, are under the illusion that they shouldn't use their hand at all that somehow they should just mysteriously do something with their body weight that gives the horse um, the, in, the information to shorten the strides and to me I think that gets riders mo way more trouble than um, even than the ones that are you know going at it and trying to I mean, the riders that are going too much front to back, and there's lots of reasons they're doing that too. But I think it is 
okay. And again, if you if you're a setup skillful, always on the balance point writer, it is okay to say that you close your hand as the main to me, the main part of the half alt. That does not mean to pull back. In the same way that if you imagine two um, teams or two people and they have a rope and they are going to play tug of war on the rope. So this is what you don't want to do. If you were using the rain in a way that two people playing a tug of war would pull on a rope, those two people would have their feet sort of closer to each other than anything else in their bodies. And then they would both be leaning back probably at at least a 45 degree angle and they would pull on that rope. And they might, their elbows might be bent or not, but they're pulling on the rope in a way that as soon as that rope breaks or the other person lets go of it, the one who actually wins the tug of war falls totally out of balance. So if you are not going to do that and you close the rein, let's say that your opponent was going to lean way back and you're going to stand, maybe lower your center of gravity, bend your knees, and be able to hold that rope and just maintain your balance without leaning back, just using a lower center of gravity and core strength to say, well, I'll try to resist this rope being pulled out of my hand and be able to, to have the weight in the hand and know that as soon as that is your partner let go of the rope, you would remain in your own balance. To me, that's not a pulling back hand. And in that way, the hand, I think, is a huge part. It's the main part of telling the horse to stop or half halt. But most people are saying, well, I can't use my hand at all. So they end up doing something else, which is invariably leaning back and pushing in the stirrup, stretching up, and probably shoving with a seat forward because they're told mysteriously to just use their seat, whatever that means. And they end up then, because they are too scared to use the hand, they think it's forbidden, they end up in a lot of ways that get biomechanically really out of whack. And so then it's just this um, really bad situation where I think riders are just kind of left hopeless. Yes. And I think at this point, maybe I should co confess that I have a cup in my possession as the captain of the Church Westcott Ladies Tug of War team. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and we beat another Westcott, having provided six of the eight of the team from my riding centre. You beat them, so that means we that you them. fell on your butts? No, well, we didn't actually, but we definitely beat them. <laughs> but it's only something to do with the ladies of Nether Westcott, not your horse. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I wonder if we should say a bit too about how if the horse starts to disorganize the rider, both of us, I think, would have the idea that you probably need to go, whoa, stop, start again. Whereas I think most people would get disorganized by the horse and keep pulling and keep going, mm -hmm. and the disorganization would get worse. So do you want to say anything about that? Well, I mean, there's a point where you know, some riders are out there, they're stopping all the time, giving too many excuses to just poop out and quit and whatever. And, you know, there's some riders, of course, that need to keep going and fix things in motion, but that's only if you can fix it in motion. If you, if riders get disorganized to the point where, you know, they can nail something and halt and walk and then they start going to trot and as soon as they're in posting trot, they just can't keep the you know, their bodies or their balance in, in a specific way that they're really trying to, to do. And you say, well, just keep trotting, you'll find it again. And they don't, they go around two or three or four or more circles, then they're really doing pretty bad practice. So it makes a lot more sense to me for the horses and the riders to um, come back to a place of knowing what's what, being able to feel and organize and get a sense of something, not being in a panic zone because they can't find it. Um, and starting again and seeing how long they can last maintaining the organization. And I mean, I've definitely learned that from you, Mary, and it makes sense with the horses too. You don't want to just push them faster if they're already out of whack. Yes. So reorganizing for the horse and for the rider keeps everybody in their stretch zone rather than their panic zone, yeah. keeps everybody learning, gets the rider in with a chance of learning some good feels and doesn't just have the horse go run around around doing it wrong, training the wrong patterns in its body. Yeah. Yeah. And um, stopping starting again can be really important in that. So I um, came across a quote a while ago, which unfortunately I can't remember who said this. And I'm not sure I have this totally right. But basically the quote went, I wouldn't give a fig for the simplicity that lies this side of complexity. But I would give my eye teeth for the simplicity that lies on the far side of complexity. 
and whether Heather's talking about a light leg aid means go and a light hand will make a half halt or a halt she's talking about the simplicity on the far side of complexity mm. where the body is so organized the rider is so congruent that it's that clear to the horse the simplicity on this side of complexity I think would be grow tall stretch your leg down sit deep use your back which maybe is meant to sound simple but really is too fuzzy to have any meaning for people and the complexity is the peeling away of all the wrong patterns mm -hmm. the learning of the right patterns the putting two and two together the building the correct neurology in your body and the correct neurology in the horse's body and on the far side is something much more simple learnable doable mm. but not accessible to most people even though most riders out there might be or most trainers out there might be going more leg or more hand mm. you know that's not it is it really mm -mm. they're not helping the rider access the simplicity on the far side of complexity so is this where we talk about expertise induced amnesia <laughs> well we did that in the last webinar okay. so not too much but okay. that could be a quick reference to the fact that so many highly skilled riders have no clue how they do what they do and might just say well I just close my hand I just use my leg as if you could do the same but they have forgotten all the learning stages they went to how they learned to be vertical sit still be organized and that rider is normally just not realizing that the more novice pupil in front of them is not them mm. yeah that person is teaching the rider in front of them as if that rider had their own skills mm. yeah so I could easily think that too I could ride my horses and think and the better I get at my own riding I could if I didn't know better from learning from Mary's teaching skills uh, and and trying not to get expertise and to induced amnesia I could also just get frustrated and say, you know, why can't my students just be Do it. ride it simple? You know, why can't they just make it simple? It's just your hand to stop and it's just your leg to go. And why wouldn't they do it? But I'm um, very glad to know that, that there's a, a way to get riders as long as they're ready for the complexity and the hard work that it takes to go through all of the layers, peeling them all off and accepting the starting point and going through all of the layers and to the point where it can be those things happening without so much conscious effort and then it can get to the simplicity which is a really nice place to be yeah undoubtedly <laughs> a really nice place to be an honor and a privilege and pretty always a hard work yeah. hard earned yeah hard um, 10,000 hours worth of good repetitions kind yeah. of deal. On the 10,000 details. <laughs> On the 10,000 details, that's exactly right. right, yes. All right, so Pete, are you there here? I wonder if we should hand over to you to maybe put up one of those pictures of Heather and to start um, relaying some questions to us. So I'm hoping we have some questions from some of the folks listening. Hi there, Mary, can you hear me okay? I can, but speak up, be loud. Okay, I'll try my best. Um, so I'm just going to make myself the uh, presenter here. And uh, hopefully my screen uh, isn't too t untidy, but uh, can everyone see the, the picture of Heather here? Oh, yes. Heather riding the beautiful rip line. And you've probably got some other Heather pictures there too, haven't you? Oh, hello. There we go. Okay, Heather riding the wonderful Paragon with a really clear vertical, good shoulder hip heel on that one. And an amazingly, <laughs> amazingly flamboyant horse mm -hmm. who probably knows he just won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a big smile on her face. <laughs> okay, and here comes another one. Okay, so there's Rip. Heather probably not quite so well lined up on that one, but in a really good neutral. And I think that's that's all the ones I have uh, arrived in my mailbox. Okay. So um, have you got questions? Yes, I have. Let, let me change the presenter uh, back to you. Okay. And uh, we'll have a look in the, the questions section. Um, Fern Tablin, I hope I've, I'm saying this correctly, uh, says... When you say stays on the balance point, are you saying stay on the greater 
trochanters or while bearing down? Well, by stay on the balance point, I think what we really mean is um, in neutral with your center of gravity over the horse's center of gravity. So there is a correct balance point and the rider might be in front of it or the rider might be behind it. So there's a picture on my screen, which I imagine people are seeing there. These are just some pictures of riders on courses at my riding center in the UK. Um, this is pretty certainly in the sit of rising trot, right? And this rider is a pretty good version of on the correct balance point. So most riders have their center of gravity too far back behind the horses. And that would be not on the correct balance point. So it's how the rider's stacked up, how she's there on her underneath. She needs to be bearing down. So bearing down is not a push back down onto the horse's back. Bearing down is you pull your stomach muscles in to make a wall and you push your guts against the wall. And um, getting on the correct balance point really means that you're not ahead of the horse. You're not behind him with him dragging you along. You're just dead where your center of gravity is over his and you're matching the forces that his movement exerts on your body. Did you say anything else to that? Um, well, if you look at that picture, um, if you imagine that you could just take that um, my Photoshop and remove the horse and the rider landed on the arena other than her foot not being um, quite parallel to the ground, she would probably land on the ground or be standing on the ground with her knees bent and not really have to take a step backward or forward to balance. I think that's a really clear way to see whether a rider is basically um, on the balance point. Yes. So that means that she kind of land down on her feet and land on the arena in that way. So this rider we can't see quite so well because of the angle of the photo. This rider on her cob, she plopped down on her feet. She's in that halfway up, halfway down stage. And you can learn this when you're very tiny. Oh. This little girl wouldn't quite make it, I think, because her butt's going a little bit backwards and her foot a little bit forwards. But she's on the right track and doing great learning at that age. Actually, that was a photograph as a while ago. I think she's an awful lot bigger than that now. So there is a correct stack up, both for the rider in terms of her balance over her feet and for the rider's center of gravity over the horse. So I'm going to hand back to you, Pete, for hopefully the next question. Sorry about that. I was uh, on mute. So actually, uh, an interesting variation of that question is uh, from uh, Paula Smeltekop. I hope I say that correctly. Uh, she asks, how do you know if you're in neutral? Uh, well, you probably need some mirrors and a coach. So you just for yourself from the feel in your body, probably without experience, can't tell. So people get used to the feeling that is home. And many people, if I say to them, well, are you on vertical, ahead of vertical, or behind vertical, will tell me they're vertical when they're not. And I think, excuse me, that one of the worst design faults in the human body is there's no spirit level. So people's perception of their body very often does not match their body as it actually is. And I think one of the things that happens in these years of training that undo the complexity and potentially take you to the simplicity on the far side of complexity is that you learn to get your body as you perceive it to match your body as it actually is. And it would take a coach and some photographs, some visual feedback for you to begin to figure out where aligned and organized is. Um, most people don't instinctively know that. It takes training, I think, to know that. Is there anything you'd add to that? Um, no, just exactly that. I mean, reality can sometimes be such a shock. And so many times you set a rider's body up and they go by the mirror and they're in complete surprise that they look like how they look. <laughs> yes. And they're sure that they've overdone and aren't at all like what reality really is. So, so I think um, it pretty much takes somebody outside of the system to really have an external eye and to ideally get their hands on the rider and to just keep doing that, coming back to neutral, coming back to neutral, coming back to neutral, doing all those repetitions until it starts to be home. Um, 
and some writers that takes a lot longer for than others and it depends how often they have lessons but potentially everybody can learn that but it, it can take some doing for many people. So I'm going to hand back to you again, Pete. Uh, Laurie Ann Salmi asks, uh, could you talk about the spirit level a little bit further? Um, I mean, perhaps are, are there questions or tactics you can get your friends to uh, ask you to be able to, you know, refine what you feel from what they see, for instance? Okay. So that primary question that goes, if we took the horse out from under the rider by magic, how would the rider land on the riding arena? That is the kind of key first question. And if the answer is she'd land on her backside or she'd land on her knees and her nose, then you're looking for shoulder hip heel. And actually I have known people's husbands who were total non-riders become quite a good eye on the ground. Heather's nodding mm. here. Oh. Um, because almost like those, those husbands are deal with simplicity at that point. Would I land on my feet if you took the horse out from underneath me is a question a husband can ask, can answer. And often answer better than a riding coach who has a whole other agenda about the horse should this and you should that and he's not got enough impulsion and blah de blah de blah. But the basic question is, would I land on my feet if the horse was taken out from under me? So you can train friends and husbands to answer that, to answer that question. And then the next question would be, is my torso vertical? And is my torso shaped like a box? So most riders are either hollow-backed or round-backed. And the hollow-backed rider has a long front and a short back, and she's banana-shaped that way. And the round-backed rider has a long back and a short front, and she's got the banana bowing out the back. And it is ridiculously difficult for many of us to learn how to find neutral spine. Even Heather, when I first met her, was hollow-backed. She wasn't neutral. She cottoned onto neutral very fast, but wasn't neutral at that beginning. And hardly any riders are. But is my body a box? Does my front match my back? Or am I banana shaped one way or the other? Am I vertical? Would I land on my feet? If you can answer those questions, you've at least got a baseline. And from doing that in halt, you're then going to, can you do it in walk? Can you do it in trot? Can you do it in canter? There's a whole load of skill that comes in the faster it goes. Anything you would add? Oh, well, I, I do have to defend myself a little bit. <laughs> I think I rode as a kid, uh, and I did Western events, and it was really just for fun. I didn't take a single lesson. And I don't know if at that point I was so hollow-backed and stretching up tall in more of, uh, more of a D shape in my upper body. I think when I started taking dressage lessons, or I started thinking, now I'm going to be a dressage rider instead of just a horse rider, I grew tall. I pushed in the stirrups. I got my stirrups were too long. So you did and what did, you were told, in I other words. I did what I was told to become a dressage rider rather than just, I grew up as a rider. And then I got into lessons and I think that I followed the traditional instructions that you that you hear and became that and thought I was doing great with it. And then Mary told me otherwise. And I'm very glad. <laughs> yes. And Heather and me too. You know, I grew up tall and stretched my leg down and did all those things for all I was worth. I tried my little heart out to do them back in the days when I was taking my British Horse Society exams. And, um, you know, so nobody does it wrong out of defiance or whatever. <laughs> Many people are out there giving it their best shot, but actually not getting fantastic information. So learning to do neutral um, can mean swimming against the tide of what most people say to riders in riding arenas. And in a way, it makes a comparison between riding and a martial art because you're getting there into a martial arts stance, rather like Heather talked about with the, are two people doing a tug of war or does the one person just stay in a martial arts stance and refuse to get involved with a tug of war? Okay, so Pete, I'm going to hand back to you and hope you've got another question there. I certainly do. Uh, this is possibly more of a question for Heather, but um, Paula asks, what is a biomechanically friendly way to give a forward consequence if the horse does not go with a light aid? Well, biomechanically, um, you know, that, that should stay the same, whether you're in, you know, not giving an aid or you are giving an aid or you're giving a consequence. So you still want to maintain the balance point. You still want to keep your upper body a box. You don't want to lose your bear down. You don't want to get left behind if the consequence makes the horse shoot out from in front of you. 
um, some horses will kick out. Maybe they'll throw their croup up in the air. Some, you know, it, it just depends on the horse's mood. But you need to be ready for uh, unexpected or expected movements in any direction. So biomechanically, you, you would want to be ready for that at any point. Um, the consequence could be uh, some repetitive taps of the whip. Uh, it could be a growl, which would have to help you bear down anyway. It could be that you give more kicks with the lower leg, but the stronger the lower leg kicks, the harder it is for riders to not have something above the knee be affected. And that is just, a, that's a coordination exercise that riders need to practice to be able to separate. When their lower leg makes an aid from the knee up, they can be unaffected. Sounds easy, but it's not. No, it's really not. That's no. a really big deal. To be on the rug when the bug go, rug goes out from underneath you, to be able to give an aid with nothing changing from the knee up, that's skill. Yeah. That's really learned skill, and very few people do that well without learning, overtly learning that skill of being with it. Yeah, and I mean, some people even, some riders even have a tough time giving a tap of the whip without their without losing their lats or without stretching up tall or caving in the side that has the whip or I mean even sometimes tapping the whip it's a it's quite a skill to learn yes. to just give a little bit of that without sort of a other things buying in just like a knee-jerk reaction so those are things you may not realize you do also might take a friend to say hey this is moving while you do that yes so really being able to isolate you know uh, a tap with your whip and, and you just use your wrist a little bit but nothing else changes or using the leg from the knee down with nothing changing from the knee up that's a skill before even let's say the rug goes out from underneath you faster than you thought it would and then you add to the skill in a really significant way okay. yeah so we should go for the next question here I think Stephanie asks on a horse just coming back into work and therefore still weak which has a rushing, quick, small steps. How can I still match the force, the horse's forces, which is not much, and rise to the trot with a complete rise without overtaking the horse's stride length and speed? So that would be about the kind of, um, I often talk about it like a game of catch that the rider plays with the horse. So you've got a horse here that's taking short, quick steps. And we'll get the rider going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, up, down, up, down, to match those steps. And ideally, the rider has to turn herself into human metronome who can go one, two, one, two, one, two, making a slower tempo. And we often use the analogy to the way the thigh moves in rising trot being rather like the windshield wiper on a car. So if the knee's the center point of the circle where the windshield pivots from, and the thigh bone is like the windshield wiper blade, and a full windshield wiper wipe kind of takes you up to the top of the windshield. And this horse may tempt the rider to do very small, very quick rises. And it really is quite an art form to be able to do uh, a somewhat slower, longer kind of rise than the horse wanted. And we're kind of saying in this, who's dancing to whose tune, you know, is the rider getting to dance to the horse's tune in one, two, one, two, one, two? Or can the rider set a different tune that goes one, two, one, two, one, two? And there's a lot of skill to that, which I don't think we could talk you through in this context. Um, and it requires an awful lot of stability in your body to be not put by the horse into his tempo rather than yourself being able to organize the tempo as you would like it to be. What, you, what would you add? Well, um, depending on why the horse has been laid off and you know why uh, it's not going in a sort of a normal workload, it sounds like it's potentially going in a quicker tempo because it's the easier route um, for a horse to go in a more cadence, slower trot is often much harder, takes a lot more bear down and balance and stability. And if the horse isn't ready for that and the tempo is just so quick and you try what Mary's discussing with the posting mechanism and it's still 
just really not possible. You can't put the horse into a slower tempo, sort of more bear down kind of cadence and tone. Then if if there's a if if you're capable of sitting that horse's trot, not every trot is sitable until the horse is ready. But if it's a trot that you could, you know, work her or him until he, uh, he's ready for higher work and more half halts, then you could maybe spend the time in walk, sitting trot, or canter or until you've got some more strength in your horse. Yeah, it's a kind of chicken and egg thing, isn't it, really, that he has to be strong enough to do it, and there may be really good reasons why he can't if he's been off work. So I think of it sometimes like if you thought of two people playing a game of catch with a tennis ball, they're sitting opposite each other, and they play this game of catch where the ball bounces once between them. So it kind of goes bounce it, catch it, bounce it, catch it, bounce it, catch it. And it's a cooperative game of catch. They're not trying to catch each other out. And then one partner suddenly, suddenly substitutes a boingy ball that goes boing, and the other one bounces it back as boing, 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 and the game is speeded up. And you're trying to keep it to that kind of tennis ball game of catch. And sometimes it can work to think of a pause in the saddle as you land and a pause in the air at the top of the rise and going, can you in those pauses keep the horse's feet on the ground for a little bit longer? But, you know, this is complex. It's not an easy one. Um, I did, however, do a little video short on this that you can find if you sign into my website. And several people have emailed me since that video short going, oh, my God, I did it. I changed my rising trot. I got oh. so much better, mm. which I thought was pretty remarkable, actually. So that's a good resource. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Hi, Mary. So uh, Clara Webb has been uh, emailing me about this particular question. Uh, so she said, what is the most efficient way to sit in canter? What is the most efficient way to sit in canter? Oh, gosh, <laughs> we're looking at can each other here. Can you define efficient? <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is probably no to that one. Um, well, many people get bumped by canter. So canter is almost almost like a sine wave. If you think of a sine wave where there's an up and there's a down and there's an up and there's a down and the up and down dynamic of canter is bigger than it is at trot. And given that when the back end of the horse goes up, the front end goes down and when the front end goes, no, what do I mean? Back end goes down, the front end goes up and the back end goes up and the front, yeah. yeah. You, you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm going there's dyslexic There's an upbeat and there's a downbeat. <laughs> All right, there's an upbeat and there's a downbeat. And that can get people really tipping and rocking a whole load in their shoulders. And a good way to think about it would be if the rider was a carousel pole and the horse was a carousel horse, the horse would go up and down in a more level way and less of a tip and rock way. And the carousel pole would go up and down perpendicular to the horse without tipping and rocking. Now, that's a lovely idea that's way easier said than done. And um, we're often trying to get riders in canter doing what we call back corners down. So, so the back of their butt starts flying out of the saddle rather than being able to keep the back of their butt in the saddle. And there's definitely an art to learning how to keep your back corners down and be closer to being a carousel pole. Well, and the other side of what happens with the back of the butt flying up on the upbeat of the canter is then riders are often often told to either drive with their seat or I've even heard some tell me that they've been told to polish the seat forward and back with their seat bones and then they start really pushing and when the horse lands with the front feet on the ground, their seat's going from their butt flying up out of the saddle on the upbeat when the shoulders are at the highest then the front legs land on the ground and then their seats going really smashing down into the saddle towards the pommel. So then there becomes this big cycle of back corners flying out of the saddle and then they're trying to get their back corners down on the downbeat and then it goes towards the pommel and then back out of the saddle and then towards the pommel and then there's this kind of circular effort of not really in the saddle in the right way on either the upbeat or the downbeat. <laughs> so the carousel pole idea is a really good one but it goes quite against a very traditional drive with your seat instruction or to you know to push on the downbeat which would make the carousel pole quite wobbly and really unstable yes and we've got a picture in, of a rider in canter here on the screen and she's not a hugely experienced rider 
and there's certainly things you could say are wrong. I mean, she's struggling with her feet and her foot is, the stirrup's halfway back on her foot rather than on the ball of her foot and her hands are a little lower than you might like, but she's a pretty good box. She's a tad ahead of vertical at this point, which is way better than leaning back. And if she really lost it, she'd probably end up leaning back on the next beat of the canter where it's just the foreleg down. And then her shoulders would be back and her seat bones would be polishing towards the front of the saddle. And then she'd end up flying out on the next beat. And she's probably doing for her level a pretty good job in her butt staying in the saddle throughout those phases of the canter stride. And that, that moment in the canter, actually, it is the, the second beat of the canter. So the first beat being the right hind, the second beat being the left hind, right front diagonal pair. That's the, that's, the, that's the second beat of the canter. And then, like Mary said, the next one would be just the foreleg, and that is the downbeat. So you, you've caught this just on the middle. So that's where the, it's a very level place between what happens on the upbeat and the downbeat. Yes, this is the kind of moment of relief, isn't it, between yeah. the upbeat and the downbeat is the places where it really goes wrong. So, you know, there's an art form to learn to sit the canter just as there's an art form to learning to organize that tempo in rising trot. Yeah. And um, it takes its time and its repetitions. Yeah. And, and try to remember, try to really watch a, a top level dressage horse doing Grand Prix in a successful way. Watch the canter and you will not see, hopefully, uh, a really big rocking motion. Ideally, you would see a top line that really stays quite level, like a carousel horse top line. It does not rock up forward and back. A greener horse will, a more trained horse will not. So even though you want expression and big strides, a lot of engagement or power, you really want to try to minimize the rocking horse effect in a canter, um, you know, no matter how much power expression um, that you're going for. And I'm just seeing the time here, realizing that it's very close to the end of our time. And in a way that takes us back to where we started at that catch 22 that goes, until the rider sits right, the horse can't go right. And until the horse goes right, the rider can't sit right. And that level, more level canter is so much easier to be like a carousel pole. Mm. And the horse that really tips and rocks and dives down on that third beat of the canter makes it so much harder for the rider. But somehow she has to get herself a bit more right to get the horse a bit more right. So it's easier for her. So it's easier for the horse. And to get into that virtuous circle in her learning that hopefully starts to stack the odds in her favor and build skill in her and good training in the horse. So Pete, we're back to you at this point, and I think this webinar might shut us down. In um, no, we're quite, we're we're all we're all right. It uh, it doesn't shut down until you decide to stop. But uh, so you know, it's a guideline. But uh, actually, a a really good ending might be uh, the question from Paula, which says, uh, "When will we get to see all those tantalising other slides?" Oh, well, at some point in time, you know, hang in long enough and we'll go through some of these tantalizing other strides. So <laughs> these are very normal everyday riders. You know, when, when you look at the slides of Heather, you're looking at an elite rider. When you look at these, you're looking at riders struggling to learn those baselines in very ordinary horses. Um, often, not all of the horses here are very ordinary, but some of them are ponies and thoroughbreds and all sorts of four-legged beasties. And... Um, I'm sure you'll see more of these slides if you come. I, I think she, I think she's about. referring to your presentation, but yes, yeah, same, same yeah. answer really. <laughs> so the other thing maybe we should say is that, um, well, maybe you should talk about the portal, Peter. Ah, right. So uh, Mary has just released a new portal on www.riderbiomechanics.co.uk. Uh, go over and have a look at that. There's uh, a great deal of resources available to you if you decide to join our portal. You'll be able to get access in some cases to monthly webinars. You'll be able to see sections of uh, Mary's videos, books. Uh, there are sections where Mary will do uh, video critiques on your writing videos. And uh, there's a forum there that you'll be able to chat with other members and uh, ask for some help with your riding problems. Uh, so just uh, go and have a look at it. Uh, it has Mary's video, which breaks down the pie of riding, which is a very interesting video. And uh, if you click on membership levels on the left hand side, you'll see all the great features that are offered by the membership portal.
And we should also say here how people can get to know more about Heather and her work. Um, I do have a website. It's www.heatherblitz.info. Uh, uh, you can also follow me on Facebook, uh, Heather Blitz. You just uh, have a fan page on Facebook. And Paragon also has a fan page on Facebook. Occasionally he's, he signs uh, in every day. He's, yes, posting his status every now and then. <laughs> So you can find information about me uh, and um, you can also sign up for my email list and I send out newsletters and press releases if you're interested in that. And our new DVD set which will hit the market very soon features some riders in a symposium that Heather and I did some time ago with Heather riding some very ordinary horses and showing how her biomechanics and her reactivity training can transform those horses in a very short time. And it's just super to see that with a pony and an event horse and all sorts of nondescript, not upper level wonderful horses like Paragon and Rip, um, Rip Line, but just to see what can happen on a another four legged average horse when it's beautifully ridden. So I think we're pretty much at our end here, aren't we? So um, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you'll come back again and I hope. Heather and I can get together again to put more little webinars and things like this together just when we're on the same continent every now and again. Every now and then. Yep. And um, thank you all for coming. Thanks very much, Mary. Thanks very much, Heather. You're welcome.